Right, that should be recording. Okay, perfect. Um, we've been representing trace elements here for the last eight, in the UK for the last 18 years. So the lab that we represent is Trace Elements. It's based in Dallas. It's had over 25 years of work specializing just in the mineral analysis. The director of the research, Dr. Watts, he's widely recognized as an authority in this area and he's published quite a lot of papers, he's written a book and so on. So what is a hair analysis? Well, we test for 29 minerals and we test for nine toxic elements. And we test for mainstream doctors, some, um, that are working privately. We test for a lot of nutritional therapists, a lot of naturopaths, some homeopaths, some herbalists. So lots of complementary and alternative. We actually test for a hospital in Wales as well, um, who are looking for something quite specific in some tests and we do testing for them. It's a widely accepted test. It's actually been used since the Victorian times in England when the police were looking for a method of testing for arsenic poisoning and hair mineral analysis was used. By analyzing the hair, the Victorian police could work out if someone had been killed by arsenic. Today, it's a really widely accepted material in the field of um, testing for drugs and even testing for alcohol. In some areas of the States, for example, we, if you have a drink driving offense, you can accept to go on an alcohol free program and then you are um, allowed to carry on, or carry on driving. They just test your hair every three to four weeks to make sure you're still alcohol free. It's used in veterinary medicine um, quite commonly, especially with equines um, and as I said, in the NHS. So why hair? As the hair is growing, this is a little example of a hair cell. When it's growing, the hair is under the scalp and the follicle is open to being washed over, if you like, with the cellular material. As the hair grows, that hardens and you get the pattern locked in. It's, um, why would we test hair? So I'm cracking through the beginning bit because it's a little bit boring. It's just the detail. And I think you kind of want to get on with the exciting stuff, which is what we're going to move on to in a moment. We would test the hair because it's a safe, non-invasive test. It gives us a chance to look at the mineral levels and it will provide a general screening test. One of the reasons I would say go up with Mineral Check is our practitioner support. Once again, my PowerPoint presentation has jammed. This is really not going as well as I'd hoped. Come on. Okay, so here we go. Um, we our practitioner support. I think also testing gives you a chance to increase your customer's confidence. A lot of our clients will go to the doctor. They'll get five, 10 minutes, and they, the doctor will often run a test frequently to get them out of the cons consulting room. And so clients are used to the concept of testing. Okay, I've now figured out why my PowerPoint screen jams. Yes, it jams every time I admit someone. I don't know why that is. Oh, okay. Any thoughts on that one, welcome. Uh, why, could you, do you want to give me back the... Um... I think if I give you back the hosting, it will stop yeah. sharing my screen. Okay. But here we go. Right, so I've unjammed it. We're kind of getting there. We're going to make this work. It's going to be fine. Um, have you given me back the... Hosting, no. But I think I figured out how to stop it happening. So, um, the very first test I ever did is this one. It's actually an equine test, and it's done on one of my horses, Apache. And the most notable thing about it, equine tests are different from human tests. We test a much, much smaller range of elements. So you just see here across the top, we'll test for calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, copper, zinc, phosphorus, iron, manganese, chromium, and selenium. One of the notable things about this test is that everything is a little bit in the low range, but one of the really significant things is the exceptionally high aluminium. Now, as with people, aluminium is really well linked to behavioral disorders. There's a lot of great research done on young offenders in humans um, and aluminium comes out quite high. So this horse beautifully behaved, 
about 60% of the time, a can fully reprobate the rest of the time. And when I found the high aluminium, I thought that was quite interesting. Aluminium is the most abundant element in the Earth's crust. Now, the same applies to humans as to horses and actually to dogs as well. We are designed to come into contact with the toxic elements, things like arsenic, beryllium, mercury, cadmium, lead. We're designed to come into contact with them all the time and just remove them. The problem can be when we, for some reason, that removal process breaks down. Aluminium is the second most, or the first most abundant element in the Earth's crust. In a highly acidic environment, so for example, acid rain, the protective measures in plants can break down. There's a lot of great research done by Neil Ward on plants going alongside the M25. Now plants should not absorb the toxins from this ground that it is grown in. The work that Neil Ward has done along the banks of the M25 in Surrey shows that actually the plants do absorb the, um, a number of the toxins, in particular aluminium. So in a highly stressful, environment the aluminium can be absorbed this horse was on exceptionally poor grazing and he was a bit of a stress bunny um, and i think that is why he easily absorbed the aluminium plus he was very very low in iron it shows us okay on this one just hitting the reference range but he frequently had bouts of um, what would it in a human be anemia and we were giving him iron and I think that it was actually that that stopped the aluminium transport in horses as well as in humans. Aluminium is a bit like a thug. There is an iron transport protein called transferrin. Think of it as looking like a flying saucer. It's designed to carry iron around the body. If there is insufficient iron, it will carry the next chemically similar thing which is aluminium. The body recognises transferrin. It doesn't look to see what's inside the transferrin. So it recognises the aluminium, it, sorry, it recognises transferrin, which is carrying aluminium, and it then is easily absorbed. Once the body has absorbed one toxic element, it's quite easy for it to absorb more. So for humans, I put some sources of aluminium just up as I was covering it, and I was talking about the transport protein. Karen, Sorry, can I just clarify then? Yeah, if someone is low in iron, yeah, they are more likely to absorb aluminium. Perfectly got, well done. Right, so that, I think that's the key point to uh, to know because you know, from my own point of view, that you know, people will be learning an awful lot about how we get toxic metals out of the body, and it's something which you know I've got good friends of mine who are nutritional therapists, which have come very unstuck trying to, for example, you know, get mercury out. I'm saying that very, but actually what I think a really good point to notice is that we have to be very careful. People can be very, very toxic and a much gentler way to try and sort these heavy metals out is to ensure that we have mineral balance. And I think that's a really key thing, which you, you know, you taught me, Karen, which has worked very well for me. You know, there are lots of very sexy ways to do, you know, and, and in certain circumstances, they may be necessary. But um, this to me is always a first port of call. Would you agree? I think that you're right. There's lots of ways of getting it out. But one of the things that I cover first off whenever I talk is how it gets there in the first place. Yes, because okay. unless we know how something gets there, we don't really know how to get it out. And then we fall prey to a lot of the really great marketing hypes on how you can get things out. Yeah. And that tends to involve a lot of product. When actually, if we go back to basics, if someone has an aluminium problem, they've had an iron problem at some point. If they've had an iron problem, they can easily have absorbed aluminium, arsenic, and lead. You can actually get lead-induced anemia, and I think I've got a client, um, a case study that I'm gonna use later on, which is purely lead-induced anemia. So there's lots we can do to get it out, but first we really do need to know the bit that most people miss. How did it get there? 
And I think that that's really important. And, and also about the balance. If someone is iron deficient, they will be absorbing a toxic element if they're exposed to it. If you can get their, their minerals up, the toxic elements will fall away anyway. So yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what you've said there. I just wanted to be really key on the mechanisms for getting them in in the first place. Because once we know that, then the getting out becomes a lot clearer. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. So I've just put some little a screen up with um, some sources of aluminium that your, your clients may have come across. One of the things I get asked lots and lots is, where is the toxin coming from? When in my earlier days, I'd be very helpful and give you lots and lots of suggestions. Now I tend to say, mm, well, I think we need to look at a good case history here because oftentimes you may not work it out. No, Somebody no. of 20 to 50 could have absorbed their toxins as a young child. So that's why I say it's a really, really good case history. Actually got to follow right the way back. And in many times, that case history can take you hours to complete. And I think often you're actually a lot better with saying, well, it's there. Let's work on roughly what's been going on for the last couple of years. Are you iron deficient? Are your adrenals compromised? Are you magnesium deficient? And so on. And then we can work on getting it out rather than focusing too much on where things come from. So I've got slides with the toxic elements that I'm going to leave with you. And I've got some suggestions for resources at the end. And I think they're helpful, but I don't think they are entirely the answer. So I've put here your sources of aluminium, but they could easily have come from a toddler just eating soil as a toddler. So it's poorly absorbed. Um, and for each of the toxins, I, there are absolutely easy methods of getting them out. And the strongest antagonist for aluminium is in fact um, glycine and magnesium. So um, there are other methods of Karen, yeah, you've got a question. I just know you haven't got vaccinations in there. Um, I haven't. I've got it in for mercury when we do mercury, which we will do later. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, aluminium's not actually the most recorded for um, vaccines, but it is in there. It's also in some drugs. Yeah. Um, why mineral check? I just put a little screen in here. We test more. Our practitioner support's amazing. I say that because I do most of it. Um, I've got a couple of other practitioners that do some as well. Um, a turnaround time, we're very quick. We can get your results back in 10 working days. So if you're working with a client and you want some answers quite quickly, that can be quite helpful. There are other methods of testing for mineral balance and I did want to cover them. Yeah. The slit tissue testing, which hair is, you can do blood testing and you can do urine testing. I'd quickly discount urine testing because you have to collect it over a 24 hour period and it only shows what's being excreted, not what, what is being absorbed. So it's not actually ideal. Blood testing is one option, but I know you all know this, so I'm just gonna cover it very quickly to remind you. The blood has a homeostatic basis. It will keep certain elements within a very, very tight range, and calcium is a perfect example of this. To go out of balance in the blood will only happen if there's an extreme pathology present. So measuring calcium in the blood is a pretty pointless exercise. It has to be kept within a tight range because if it does not, if the body lets it go out of that range, heart problems or respiratory problems will occur. So if the body wants to move something out of the blood to protect its range, it can put it into the tissues. So we can look at hair testing, for example. Other tissues we could look at would be liver or kidneys, but they mean a biopsy. And that's not really something that is that easily accessible. I put a little study up here. This was done in the 1970s. It's never been repeated, but it's a great study. Cows were given 300 parts per million of cadmium in their drinking water. Um, so the average intake, 4.5 milligrams over 12 weeks, that is very low. Biopsies were done in the liver and the kidneys and also the hair and the levels were comparable after four weeks. Now what's really interesting about that study which I haven't got on the slide is that the researchers also measured the blood levels of cadmium and during the whole 12 weeks cadmium never showed up. The reason for that would be that the cadmium is extremely low. 
So it's almost being ingested and removed and stored. It doesn't show up in the blood at all. So I think that's quite a useful thing of thinking about it. When we think about how does someone get the toxin? Well, it probably wasn't one big insult. It's been a gentle drip, drip, drip over a period of time. For me, it's a really, it is the most useful test about testing, looking at someone's biochemistry. Caroline did a great thing about how she uses it in clinic, and I know she uses it a lot, and how it's inexpensive, and how you can learn a lot. And I think that those are great. I get asked a lot, when would I use it? And the cases I will always use it in are children, infertility, mental health, stress, if someone's just got a multitude of stressy type symptoms, and hormonal balancing. So those are the cases that I would use it automatically. Karen, I don't, I don't do a lot of fertility. Would you give me a couple of pointers on why you use it particularly for fertility? Okay, um, I, okay this is me as a practitioner. If yeah. someone wants to come and see me for infertility, the most important thing in their life is getting a baby. I might not be able to fit in the cl in the, into clinic for a week, two weeks, three weeks. So what I'll do is I'll book them in. And then I will send them the kit and I will get them to do the kit the test before they come, which yeah. means that I can already be looking for reasons. So as soon as they walk in, we can come up with a protocol. People love that because they know that the minute they walk into my clinic, I am ready to focus on them and getting them a baby. That's really important for them. So there's a huge amount of client confidence here. Also, if they've had to wait three to four weeks to get the appointment, they're not going to go anywhere else because they know we're ready to go almost immediately. And then what I'm looking for, I'm looking for sodium and potassium. I want to know what their stress is like because that's going to be affecting the hormonal balance. The one thing with women I'm looking for is their copper level. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. You'll all remember copper IUDs are used to prevent pregnancy. It's the copper that will do it. If there's a high copper level, someone's unlikely to get pregnant. Equally, if there's a toxin present, they're yeah. unlikely to get pregnant. And with men, even if they don't want to come for the consult, I'll get them to do it if they will, because if there's a toxic element present, we know that's going to be affecting sperm motility and viability. And I'm a little bit blunt with men. I just tell them that, you know, suck it up. Three weeks, four weeks, we can improve their sperm quality. Their wife's going to be doing this for nine months. So, um, yeah. I can right. be quite encouraging in getting the men on board because um, a lot of practitioners will go, oh, the men will never test and so on. And I'm like, yeah, let them have five minutes talk with me. They probably will. I think they just realize they're going to get worn down. So they do. Um, so with men, I'm looking for toxic elements, for women specifically, zinc, copper, their stress profile. Yeah, perfect. Um, so I've kind of covered why testing. I put a little bit here. Um, as a lab, I get asked a lot about how reliable the test is so we have great quality control we test every 24 samples we will feed in a sample which has a known pattern so you can buy from japan bulk samples of hair which have known patterns and they're put in we also do spike samples so if we have um, a sample which is highly contaminated we and there's a big sample we might run it through again about 30 samples later just to check that we're getting exactly the same reading. And large samples are sometimes split in half so that we can just check that both are identical. The lab is licensed and regulated. I've put a little hope here. Not all lab tests are equal, because this one comes up for me a lot. Um, if you go into Google, um, and I'm not going to encourage you to do it while I'm talking, but you can find that there are a lot of lab tests online. And they offer to test for things like food intolerances and parasites oh, yeah. through the hair. I heard Caroline go, oh yeah, she's come across those I did all, and they're a load of rubbish. Oh, bless I you. I try everything. I try absolutely everything. When I get something through, I don't rubbish it until I actually go, send me a free test, I'll do it, because I know my own stuff. And I've never had one come back. I mean, I think all they do is douse, isn't it? Yeah, they are done by dousing. I have nothing against Incredibly dousing. Incredibly unreliable. Incredibly unreliable. But there's I nothing no way they can dousing. do it, is there? No, okay, I've nothing against dowsing, and I always put that no, in, no, no, nothing no, against no. dowsing. I dance right. in my field, that's how I know where the water runs in my field, it's where, how I found a main yes. water. But, would I douse for someone's parasites? No, because I'm not that good, and actually, I, at my core, 
I'm a scientist. And so all of those tests are done by dowsing and they have no scientific validity. Yes, you can check checks for minerals. Yes, you can check um, drugs. Yes, you can test for alcohol metabolites. You can tell if someone's got a tendency to anorexia by looking at things like their phosphorus levels. But you cannot test for parasites or food intolerances through the hair. You need different tests. We're scientists at the end of the day. Let's stick with what we can do. Um, so yeah, I, that's what I really mean about um, keeping it real. Um, little sample, just going off to the lab. What we do is we're looking for a, centimetre, a four centimetre long sample, so about an inch, ideally from the back of the head, anywhere on the head will do. Um, make sure the scissors are clean, that kind of goes without saying. Um, it is possible to test the nails, it is possible to test pubic hair. I would only test body hair and nails to confirm the presence of, of a toxic element or not. You would not use those samples for anything other than um, the toxic elements, simply because they are too old. I have to tell you a funny story, Karen. I don't know whether I've told you this, but I had a client, I'd rarely do clients, but I had one in Spain and he was, um, he was a tough old one. And, um, but he wanted to do all these tests. Anyway, eventually I said, right, we do a hair mineral test. Um, and he said, great, we'll do that. But the only problem was he was bald. Um, so I obviously, I must have spoken to you and we agreed he'd do a pubic hair test, but obviously he had to send the sample to me. But of course he sent the sample, but sent it in an envelope, but without putting an envelope within an envelope. Oh no! So I had, <laughs> I'm sitting at this desk and I remember opening this envelope and it, everything just piling out onto the desk. Oh yeah. Pretty. It was pretty gross. So anybody, if anyone, if anyone's got any bald clients, then do ask them to put the envelope within the envelope. So that's my little tip for today. We do actually say that on our sample sort of <laughs> collection, put the envelope in an envelope. But actually, oh, yeah. my admin girl, when she's opening samples, she's so cautious because, yeah, it does happen. Um, anyway, growth physiology, pubic, pubic hair grows to a certain length, hangs around, then drops out or lands on Caroline's desk. Your in Spain. Anyway, uh, grows for a certain length, hangs around, drops out. So you don't, and then another one grows. Head hair grows continually. That's why with pubic hair, you wouldn't know how old the sample is. So you would be looking at it maybe to know if there's a toxic element present or not, but I wouldn't use it for anything else. Um, external things. I get asked a lot if dye can affect the hair. Um, and be, um, to be honest, I don't believe it does. I know what I know the theory, but I've never seen a sample that, it, well, actually I have, and I'm gonna show it to you in a minute. I just want you to see how obvious it is, but I don't believe they really do. The one thing that does are medicated shampoos. If someone's using an anti-dandruff shampoo, I'd ask them not to. So this is Gordon, and I wanted to put it up because you can see his excessive lead level. Um, I keep looking for the pointer on here because the last webinar I did had a really funky pointer control um, and I know Zoom doesn't have that. Um, but the lead, which is PB in toxic elements, is exceptionally high. This is actually a retest, which is why there's two rows of figures. When he first went for um, testing, it was, his lead level was 142.5 milligram percent. To transfer that to parts per million, you just move the decimal point over one to the right. So that's a 1,425 parts per million. At the retest, it had gone up to 2,269 parts per million, or 226.9 milligram percent. So the reason we use milligram percent is it's just a smaller number. So much easier to talk through. And with this client, I brought it up because you can see how exceptionally high that lead level is. And when the test was first done, the practitioner, this is not one of my clients, the practitioner is a great friend of mine. And she rang me up and said, well, actually what happens when you have a really excessive high level is you get a call from me saying there's a really weird result coming back, but we have double checked it and we know it's valid. And I went back and said, this is the lead level. We talked about sources. We talked about what she was going to do. And I said, it's so high. He's dyeing his hair black. And my hunch is he's using something like Grecian 2000 or something like that that will turn it black very quickly, quickly because the blackening comes from the lead. 
Now, if you're putting that on your hair in a hot, steamy environment like a bathroom, you're opening the pores of the skin, so it will be absorbed as well. He denied he was dyeing his hair. She put him on the most extensive supplement program. I have no idea how she got him compliance on a whole carrier bag full of supplements, but she did. She ran the retest, the result came back, and she rang me up and said, look, Karen, the lead's even higher. You know, what's going on? And my comment simply was, he is dyeing his hair. He may tell you he's not, but he is. <laughs> and by the way, that thallium, which is down at the bottom in the additional minerals, TI, it was originally um, 622 milligram percent, it's now 462. It's come down, that's excessively high. What else is he doing? And she said she had no idea, but she had great client com compliance. He was a lovely client. And at the next consultation, he was even bringing his wife because she was so on board with the whole thing. And I said, great, ask him what else he's doing. and Check about dyeing his hair, maybe in front of his wife. You might get a different story. And she rang me up on the day of the consultation and said, that's the last time I listened to your suggestions, Karen. I asked him about dyeing his hair. And I introduced it by saying, the woman at the lab thinks you're dyeing your hair. And he immediately apparently said, no, he's not. And the wife turned around and went, oh, don't be so vain. Tell her the truth, you do. So embodied by the fact he'd been ratted out by his wife, he fessed up that the thallium was indeed a herb he was taking to improve his vitality and sex drive, which led to a row in the clinic and they both left. Um, your clients don't always tell the truth, I suppose, is the moral of that story. He did actually go back and he did um, comply and he stopped dyeing his hair. Um, but I kind of put that one up because your clients don't always tell the truth. But more specifically, I wanted you to see how exceptionally obvious it is if someone is using something that is affecting the results. Um, I've covered, so I've got a couple of slides here just about using them in practice. And I talked here about um, parts per million, which we did. And then I put this one up because um, I get asked a lot to cover case studies. And we talked about uh, earlier on um, lead induced anemia. And I said, I've got a case study for you. This is Anne. She had 44 years old. She had been anemic for over 10 years on and off. And her GP kept prescribing her iron sulfate. I'm guess that nearly all of you winced at that, but you know, that's what GPs will often prescribe. And she would take it until her symptoms went and then she would stop because she always felt that, you know, the anemia wasn't being resolved. She couldn't remain on iron sulfate forever. It was very constipating. So she would stop it. And her symptoms would come back. She would be tested. She'd be back on the iron. Her GP actually suggested she contact a nutritional therapist, and she did. And the nutritional therapist said to me, um, have you any thoughts on why someone would keep getting anemia? And my first comment was, yeah, a shortage of vitamin E. E helps the body transport the iron into the heme. And my second thought is I would run a hair test because I would be looking for lead. You can have lead-induced anemia. And this is such a brilliant study because the test came back and you can see there that the level of lead is very high. So this is lead induced anemia. You can see how magnesium is very low. That is a superb antagonist for lead. So um, we're, we're gonna rebalance the nutritional minerals. You can see her sodium and potassium are very low. That's giving us a clue that her adrenals are depleted. So again, um, we're going to boost adrenal function. We're going to get that magnesium up. We're going to be using antioxidants. There's a lot we can actually do. And interestingly, if you look at her iron level, it's quite high. Yeah. And that would be because she's been taking iron sulfate. It's not been being utilized properly because it's being blocked by the lead. Really lovely case because um, she felt better almost immediately following a good nutritional program. Um, detox the lead over a period of about six to eight months. Um, and as far as I know, apparently the anemia went and didn't come back. Um, the practitioner kept in touch with her for a while and she was, um, yeah, just a great success story. One of the other things that's quite interesting is that the molybdenum is very, very low and iron sulfate will lower molybdenum. 
and molybdenum is key in driving the sulfur reactions. A toxic element binds to sulfur in order to come out of the body. Now you can see that the sulfur is low, so there's probably not enough sulfur on this first test, and the molybdenum is low. So the body is going to struggle to take that lead, bind it to the sulfur and excrete it out of the system. So key there would also be boosting the molybdenum and boosting sulfur levels. I'm going to ask Caroline if she's got any questions on that case history. I always remember I was very low in molybdenum and I can never say it. Um, where do we get that from again? Okay, um, hang on a second. No, I haven't. I sometimes have a screen on there, but I didn't include it on this one. So um, it's actually in most vegetables and, and whole grains. So it's interesting that she's so low in it. Um, I often will boost it, um, and I have absolutely nothing to do with um, BioCare here. Um, I'm just going to tell you a product that I've seen work really, really well. If molybdenum is very, very low, um, they do a product called Nutrisorb Molybdenum and you use one drop a day. It's so low, you not yeah. think it would do anything. Um, it's so tiny. But what I see on test results, um, at the, the next one, if you like, the retest, the molybdenum comes right up. So it's in your whole grains, it's in your vegetables, it's in your pulses, it, it's in your lentils, it's in the food that you eat all the time. Yeah, well, it's like potassium. I mean, you know, I remember many years ago, you know, not even considering that my potassium was low because I ate my vegetables etc but it was um and, and so here well, you've you got know, to think about your drivers as well you're absolutely right yeah it was stress obviously but yeah. i think it's a really good lesson because we are so focused on food and of course we should be and it is the first portal call but it just shows that if something's not working it's always a good idea to then test because you'd be surprised i mean you know, magnesium is a classic one. It, you know, quite frankly, it doesn't matter how much green leafy veg anyone eats. Um, no, you're you know, so right. Doesn't, um, you know, depending on their genetic predispositions and certainly, um, you know, I would look at that through iridology. But I mean, it really, you know, it's just constantly can be low until you and the other the other point is then when you um, are looking at supplementation and obviously I run a nutrition college and we you know we teach people to be moderate in their supplement recommendations and not we're not really into doing mega doses but again and again with children as well I find it really important that you have some evidence to start raising levels to any, um, you know, large amount, so to speak. I've got a question from Elaine who says, she is a client with sulfite sensitivity. Is the test reliable for molybdenum? I was yeah. told by another hair mineral testing company that it wasn't. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I took a good job my camera some work. I put my head in my hands. I know, you would have, uh, yeah, you'd have. Yeah, okay, out. yes, it is. So I'm going to um, backtrack a little bit. Remember the slide I put up about um, testing and validity? As a lab, all of the nutritional elements, all of the toxic elements, and indeed all the um, additional elements that we talk about, the lab has to verify and prove to an American inspector that those are actually valid for us to report. Now, I get asked a lot about iodine. Wouldn't it be useful if we test iodine? And it would. But iodine is actually an element that's very unstable in the hair. And the lab have tried over and over and over again. I cannot stabilise the iodine sufficiently to satisfy the inspectors of the lab that will licence it, that we can report iodine. So every element that we report, we have already proved that we can, that it is reproducible. So if we were to test Anne um, three months, six months, nine months down the line, her sample, we would get exactly the same reading, as long as it was the same sample for molybdenum. And also boron went missing as well. Somebody's asked about that. Yeah, okay, so boron is actually quite difficult to stabilize. It's possible to stabilize, but it does have, a, it requires additional work. It hasn't gone missing. 
we just re we will report it if you ask for it it's an, ex an additional seven pounds um we used to report boron um, and the lab would do the work to stabilize it included in your initial test but as the lab got busier and busier and busier to actually do that work for an element which um flies up and down to be honest as you're balancing someone it was deemed not necessary if you want boron you can request it it's an extra seven pounds if you're a practitioner that's seen a lot of it what you will find is that boron goes up and down as you're rebalancing it bears no real relationship to what you're doing with the client it just goes up and down so if you work with a client long term three maybe test number three test number four you might start thinking about boron if you're working with, I work with a practitioner that always requests boron on menopausal women and she will supplement boron um, and she has great results about it. So there can be good reasons for testing boron um, and you might want to think about it, but it's not something that we report unless requested. Well, I mean, it makes sense if it's sort of menopausal women, doesn't it? So it does. Yeah, for that it does. And, and, and so for that one, I would just think about it. The other one that we actually reported for Anne because we were asked, but we um, do as an additional is antimony. Um, again, antimony is, there is a lot of research on it as a toxin. Um, I don't know why it was tested um, on this one. The practitioner obviously wanted it for a reason. I don't know what that would be. Um, I personally might ask for antimony on a child's report if the child has a lot of behavioral issues. Um, can you it explain is, what it is? Yeah, it's not very well known. No, I don't know. I haven't heard of it. It's a toxin. How do you spell it? Because I can't see it. A-N-T-I-M-O-N-Y. Antimony, okay. It's £25 if you have it tested. And I don't always test it, but I might with a child. It's found in fixatives, rubbers and dyes. Children okay. who put things in their mouth. Yeah. will often have, well, I say often, they will sometimes have high antimony. Um, and it's also found in fireproof coatings. And, you know, young children put a lot of things in their mouth. Yeah, yeah. So I might run it then. Um, so Elaine is asking, is there a normal range for molybdenum? Um, great question, Elaine. So the reference range we have, all labs, and this applies to every element, you can see we've got a reference range, which is the pale blue area. And that's where we would normally expect to see. A lab can't produce in anything a reference range based on what it thinks is ideal. And so if you go to the GP and you have your thyroid level, hormones level measured, there is a point at which the GP goes, yes, you're hypothyroid. And there's a point at which you say not. That wasn't a great example because I know there's a lot of controversy around that, but just yeah. bear with the simple things for a minute. You're either hypothyroid or you're not. With the nutritional minerals, this is a screening test. It's not diagnostic. So we have to report our reference ranges based on what we find. So if you all think back to your maths when you're at school and your bell curve, um, that is effectively what you're looking at. You've got your low end, you've got your high end, and then in the middle, you've got that big bell shaped part of the curve. And that's your reference range. That is where most people fall, and that is what you're looking for to get people in that reference range. And I would say as high as possible within it, but that's ideally what you're looking for. Okay. Um, and you're looking for that for all of the elements. But also importantly, you are looking for it, these elements in relationship to each other. So if you look at Anne, you see she's got an excessive low and high calcium level and a very low magnesium level. To work out a ratio, you take one level and you divide it by the other. So calcium 60, magnesium 5 would give you a ratio of 12. That's 12 parts of calcium to one part of magnesium. And if we have a look here, um, Anne's very roughly would be around about 90 parts to one. So that's what a ratio is. And we would look for, oh, there we go. How did I do on my maths? Yeah, I didn't do too badly, actually. It's 77.59. Um, so her calcium magnesium is 77.59. We're looking at how one mineral compares to the other. So not necessarily looking at it on its own. So with her, we could see that her calcium is high, her magnesium is low. 
when we look at Horatio, we can see it's very, very elevated. And each of those ratios and the significant ratio means something. Now, I don't want to keep you here all evening. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to move on to some of the more interesting stuff. So I'm going to whiz through the next slides. And I'm more than happy to share the slides with you. Um, and, but this will tell you a little bit about what each of those ratios you see there, calcium to phosphorus, sodium to potassium, and so on, what each of them mean. So the calcium phosphorus, that's where we get our metabolic rate, where we look at whether or not someone's a slow oxidizer or a fast oxidizer. Um, I'm not going to cover that in this webinar, but we might actually do another one if Caroline's interested on where we yeah, look absolutely. at oxidation. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, I always forget that stuff. So I'm, <laughs> I always like a reminder. Okay, so I'm happy to come back and do another yeah. one. Um, uh, calcium magnesium. So this is great. You know by just talking to someone if they've got a blood sugar imbalance. So I guess that most of us uh, see clients all the time with blood sugar imbalances. But this gives you a bit more of a clue. Insulin is um, released from the pancreas. The release mechanism is dependent on calcium and the switching off is dependent on magnesium. So you have a very trigger, if you have an excess of calcium, you have a trigger happy calcium release, uh, sorry, insulin release. So when you've got a calcium magnesium ratio like that, yeah, you know your client's got blood sugar problems. You've actually got to tackle that ratio to help them get in touch with their, get their blood sugar back down under control. So this is really, for me, quite a vital ratio, um, little graphic there. And one of the things that's quite interesting about vitamin D is if you take vitamin D with a pattern like this, you've got an excess calcium, your mineral balancing will be to get that calcium back under control. Vitamin D promotes the renal absorption of calcium. And so you're encouraging the body to detox something through the renal system that then you give another element that encourages it to take it back up again. So you're creating a spiral. You're saying, get rid of it. Oh, here's something else to make you put it back into the system. Karen, that's a really difficult one, isn't it? Because, you know, in this day and age, when we're all screaming about vitamin D to help with respiratory and immune, yet on the majority of hair mineral testing, including my own, there is a often, so often, a high calcium to magnesium ratio, isn't there? That absolutely is. So my response here is do a blood test, find out what your vitamin D levels is, yeah, supplement. Agreed. Get your vitamin D up, then stop supplementing it. Don't fall for the hype that you have to take it all the time. On a day like today, get out in the sun. Let your body make what it needs. And I think that's really key. And the other thing is to remember that when there's a magnesium deficiency, it's very hard for the body to absorb any vitamin D you take anyway. Yeah. And it's not just the magnesium is deficiency, low magnesium, it's the relative deficiency to calcium. So my little graphic here, which was a female depression, the calcium is very, very low, the high, the magnesium is very, very low. It's a relative deficiency. Even if that magnesium was in the reference range, we'd still have a, a massive amount of calcium so we would have an issue absorbing and retaining vitamin D anyway. And that point about magnesium is so often overlooked. Yeah. Um, I put a little screen up here because Caroline brought up her own calcium was very high and sort of around 85% of the UK tests do have elevated calcium. This is so, so common. It means that the calcium is there, but it is not being utilized and therefore it will be being deposited in the joints and it will be feeding into blood sugar problems. Um, it, came, it came into a calcium gallstone. Is that what happened for you? Yeah, yeah, so I checked because I got an x-ray to check because most of it's cholesterol, normally cholesterol, but I had an x-ray and it was actually calcium. Um, just a question on magnesium supplementation because it's something which is, um, you know, I mean, you know, how high have you had to go in as a practitioner? Because Okay, I had this come up in the office today. Um, three different practitioners asked me this question. I will routinely su um, supplement 600 milligrams of magnesium in divided doses three times a day. And alongside that, I will give 50 milligrams of B6 yeah. 
again in the divided doses three times a day which i know is a high level of b6 but i will do it to get the magnesium absorbed and i will do that for a period of three months yeah but that seems to be quite a lot of magnesium but i think well I was sort of thinking even higher, to be honest. But I mean, I know from my own personal experience with my son, you know, I think when you're dealing with children, you have to have evidence to be supplementing at quite a high rate. Um, but when I tested my son, even after supplementation, his magnesium was low. He had chronic ear, ear issues. Um, and I had to supplement him adult doses. Now, that's easy because I was his mother and I knew what I was doing. But again, I just think it illustrates the importance um, of having some evidence to do these sort of higher doses. I think you're absolutely right. And yeah, I would go with higher doses than that, but I might not do them all orally. Orally, I might do something like um, magnesium in the bath. I might use spray magnesium. I'm a huge fan of dermal absorption of magnesium. It seems to work really, really well. If you Google better you and their magnesium tests, you'll find a piece of research that we did which was amazing on how well absorbed magnesium is. Quite old now, but a really great paper. I wrote an article on that and I was, again, I'd heard from, you know, quite, um, um, well, one of the ladies who works for Lambert's who was absolutely adamant that it absolutely made no difference. So I was always, I was delighted to find out that study. And actually it's quite useful, isn't it? Uh, hair mineral testing to, to, um, to test these things actually, isn't it? I think so, absolutely. Um, yeah, without a doubt. And, and I find out that there, with when I, I see low magnesium so much, and it really feeds into my next point about, you know, we can look at vitality in the adrenals. Sodium and potassium are controlled by the adrenals. If someone is stressed, the first thing they'll use up is their magnesium and their B6. Um, and if we look at the hair mineral test, it'll give us a clue about um, the adrenals. And I think that's a really a useful adjunct. We can see they're low in magnesium. We can see they're really stressed. We can give magnesium. We know we also need to look at supporting the adrenals. Just a couple of questions, Karen. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're stepping back a bit, but I don't want to miss the questions. Um, what's antimony's antagonist? Uh, magnesium. Okay. And Epsom salts or mag chloride? Either. Oh, uh, okay. I gotta tell you this. Um, I actually grew up in a racing stable. When I came into the natural health industry, um, I was appalled at all of these people going on about Epsom salts baths. I couldn't believe it. To me, I was horrified about it. I never have got over my genuine horror at the idea of using Epsom salts in the bath. I know the theory, guys, I do, but I grew up in a racing yard. Do you know all of the jockeys? would just sit in Epsom salt baths for as long as they could. They are incredibly dehydrating. It means they will lose pounds. These guys also went for a run in plastic bags, I have to tell you, to also use a few, lose a few more pounds because it was flat racing. Um, but in order to get their weight down, jockeys will sit in Epsom salt baths. If you've grown up around that, you cannot possibly believe for one moment that sitting in Epsom salts is healthy. Well, you, um, I didn't realise you weren't a fan of it. No, I'm not. But that's why I always don't do it with the fact that actually, as far as Epsom salts goes, I just can't get my head around it because of that kind of whole childhood Yay. history thing. But what I say now is, look, if you want to use Epsom salts in the bath, that's fine. It can be helpful to detox. Yeah. But there are a couple of things you need to do. The first thing is you really must ensure adequate hydration. And I can't stress that enough. If you're going to use Epsom salts, it is dehydrating, so make sure you are properly hydrated before you get in that bath and drink water while you're in it and drink it when you get out. That, I think, is critical. Otherwise, you are stressing your adrenals. And the other point is Epsom salts can help the body detox. This is going to make me so popular with you all, I know. Cold shower before you get in the bath and then cold shower when you get out. Oh, yeah. And the reason is yeah, you are going to have toxins sitting on your skin. Your skin is an organ of detoxification. Don't then 
go through a normal day and sink into an Epsom salts bath at night and think you're doing a fantastic job because what you're actually doing is opening up all the pores and forcing the toxins back in. So cold shower, Epsom salts bath, properly hydrated. I can cope with that. Okay. Okay. I mean, I love them, but I, do you know what I, you, so you make a good point about the hydration because it really does suck it out. I don't know how it does it, but you're right. It does do that. And the other thing is it's definitely not something you'd want to be recommending to clients every day. You know, twice no. a week is enough. Exactly. Whereas some of the things like the better you sorts, you can do those every day without any problems. Well, it's good to have a variety of things rather than taking pills, you know, um, but the magnesium oil and lotions are from Better You are very good as well. Great. Again, I should say um, I, I'm not paid by them. They're just something that... Oh, I know you're not. I know, you're not. No, I well, know, I know that, but I just want to make that point for everybody else because one of my big things is, you know, we all go to webinars and people talk about products and a lot of the time it is about marketing a product and I tend to talk about products that I've just seen that work rather than we actually have our own range of supplements and I can happily talk about them, but I would rather you, and they do work. But when I talk about things randomly, I'd like to talk about things that I know work. Sure. So, um, yeah, the magnesium oils, that's all a great idea. And I think it's great to use a variety of things, particularly something like magnesium, which we use up so easily. Uh, again, we've sort of covered sodium magnesium. So I'm going to whiz through that one. Calcium, potassium. It's a fantastic, guide to what's going on with the thyroid if the ratio is high then someone's most likely hypothyroid um, and the reason here is that potassium helps the body transport thyroid hormone across the cell wall and i'd look at it in association with selenium because selenium is the, the mineral that is key to releasing the thyroid hormone um zinc and copper gives you a clue about um um Estrogen and progesterone balance, just a clue, a couple of scars in there. Uh, iron to copper give you a clue about um, iron. Um, I put a thing, a separate one here. Copper imbalance is a really common pattern, um, particularly with women. It relates strongly to an estrogen overload, um, a liver detoxification issue. It will suppress thyroid function, it will suppress adrenal function. For the body to use the copper, it has to bind it to a blood protein called seroplasmin. Seroplasmin is produced in the liver. It is produced, the signal to produce it, sorry, is given from the adrenals. If you have low adrenal function, the adrenals won't tell the liver to make the seroplasmin, so the copper rises. And then you have another of these cycles where the copper starts to suppress thyroid and adrenal function. So the adrenals want to do less. So they don't do the critical, or they, they don't do the ancillary functions. They don't keep reminding the liver to make the seroplasmin. So you have that cycle going on. Um, toxic elements. I kind of have put this in. So we talked a little bit about it as we were going. Absolutely, my key here is liver support, adrenal support, detoxifying foods, and rebalance the nutritional minerals. Now, I did say earlier, I do this test for um, infertility all the time. I'll do it before they come and see me. I will absolutely, in infertility, focus on the toxic elements and try to get them out as quickly as possible by throwing as much product, as much diet, as much things like cold showering and um, I might actually even use Epsom salts in the bath if I can insert my client is properly hydrated and so on. I'll use skin brushing, I'll use all sorts of things to get the toxin out. If it's not infertility, and I say if it's infertility, then the most important thing is the baby. So that's what we're going for. If it's not infertility, I would say the body is in a really intelligent machine. It will only want to remove a toxic element when it has the resources to do that. And that's where we start to rebalance the nutritional minerals. So we'll look at the nutritional minerals and we'll see what we need to do to rebalance them. And I won't be thinking so much about, oh, there's a lot of mercury present. Oh, there's a lot of lead present. I'll be thinking, okay, the magnesium is really low, for example. I need to get the magnesium up. Because then if I can get enough magnesium up, the body will take care of it. I'm being a bit anthropomorphic, so forgive me. 
but the body will take care of the toxic elements by itself. Um, I put a little note here to toxifying foods. There is some good research on using things like leaf coriander. Um, I apologize if anyone's Italian, um, but you can make a great pesto using leaf coriander instead of basil. It will freeze well, and then people can just use a couple of ice cubes every day as a nice, easy way of getting lots of coriander into their diet. It'll go in soups, it'll go over a salad, it can go on a salad dressing, it can go on a jacket potato. Um, I think it's a really useful way of using a food to help remove a toxic element. Um, about chlorella? Yeah, what about chlorella? I mean, it can be quite um, full on. I'm not a fan people of get, chlorella. People can uh, get really um, quite sick on it. I'm not a fan of chlorella, partially because it sits in the, it's not really a food, we're supplementing. We're supplementing, focusing on the heavy metal, whereas I prefer to supplement focusing on the nutrients balancing. We also need to be absolutely certain about the purity of the chlorella. Um, and I do like to see proper purity certificates. They like, and they will change per batch. Just because you saw one four years ago, that brand will have changed its batch of Corella, so you need to make sure it's still being tested, and you need to see it each time the batch changes. And also, and this is again, it's a bit of a personal view, I think people have a limited amount of money that they're happy to spend on supplements, and I like to give supplements that do a job focusing on balancing their nutrients. I don't tend to give supplements that will chase out a toxic element so much. That again is a really personal view. I know some people are huge fans of Corella, and if you're finding it works for you, fantastic. It's just not, my approach is more focused on getting the nutrients right. Brilliant. Um, okay. Have we got any other questions? Somebody just saying, yeah, their mother got very unwell trying even small amounts of chlor 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 I can't even say it. And I've got a good friend who, who took it for mercury and also got extremely ill. So I think you've got to be very, very cautious with this. Um, and, it, and, and actually, she was someone you wouldn't have expected. She was a nutritional therapist and, you know, certainly didn't, wasn't considered, I wouldn't have considered particularly toxic, if you know what I mean. So, you know, um, I think it's something you've got to be cautious with. And my, my view is that go with balancing and see where you get to with that. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, we don't have to go all in and um, uh, initially. So I'm conscious that we don't want to go on too long. And also just to let everybody know that we will email you the presentation. And also, Karen, I know you've got that ratio list as well. Ah, well, okay. So I don't want to go on too long. And I've actually done quite well at whizzing through because I've virtually finished. Okay. I've got a test. I've got the case study, which I'm happy to talk through if you've got a few yeah. minutes left. Absolutely. Um, and I've got a practitioner guide. Um, and it, it's a little ebook that I wrote, which covers a lot of what I've said. So yes, I've got the practitioner handout, but I've actually got um, a, a book which covers a lot of what I've said and it's fully referenced. For the people who love the science, there's a whole two pages of references at the back. Are you happy for us to send that out? You can download it yourself here. All right, brilliant. Okay, so if you go to get talk at NNA, there's a little link there. I've got it there. If you just whiz on, pop your email address in, and you can download it yourself this evening. Get talk at. So it's there. We'll get put talk it in the chat out for people. Perfect. Oh. And yeah, I'm absolutely happy to have for you all to have the slides. I do actually have a handout on ratios. I'll send yes, that to that, you. That's so what you I was thinking because I always keep that. I've got that in my um, in my little inbox here. Um, I just started working with. We've just got a new designer on board actually, and I'm going to, I'm going to send it to her to jazz up a bit. But yeah, I will send that to you. Oh, fabulous. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the end um, where I am. So if you're thinking about questions, start typing them in the chat box, and I'll just quickly whiz through Jean who is, I put up as a case study, because she'd had a long history of allergies. She had a very restrictive diet. 
Uh, it was one of those candida diets. It was in the most restrictive diet I've ever seen in a client. I couldn't have stuck to it for five days. How she had stuck to it for a couple of years, I have no idea. Um, and this is so great because you can see here, just covering what I've talked about. We've got the elevated calcium. We've got a shortage of magnesium. We've got, so we've got blood sugar issues. We've got low sodium and potassium. So we've got adrenal issues. We've got high copper. So that's going to be giving us depression. It's going to be affecting the adrenals. If we have low adrenal status, we have low cortisol. So we've got low anti-inflammatory hormones. The zinc level looks a bit too good to be true, particularly bearing in mind the um, magnesium, sodium and potassium. She had been supplementing zinc, but she had not been supplementing B6, so it wasn't being properly utilised. We've got a low level of manganese. Um, that will affect energy more than anything else. We've got, and it has been lowered by the zinc. If you supplement zinc and you don't supplement manganese, you'll cause a man manganese deficiency in the end. We've got an exceptionally high mercury level. So we've got a toxin in there. We've got down in the additional minerals, we've got high nickel. Um, again, that's really well associated with allergies. And we have a high tin level. Tin affects the P450 enzymes in the liver. So virtually um, that's going to be really compromising her detox pathways. So we've got lots and lots to work on and I put it in there and I've whizzed through it quite quickly, but hopefully it will give you a clue when somebody comes in and you know, she'd been seeing another nutritional therapist, which is how they'd come up with this really restrictive diet for it. She had allergies, she had really low energy, um, she was chronic fatigue, had therefore been retired from her job because of chronic fatigue, you really start to see here how all of that ties together with the pattern. The copper will be feeding into the adrenal insufficiency. The adrenal insufficiency feeds into the allergies. The manganese feeds into energy production. We've got detoxification issues with the tin. We've got a toxic element. Loads and loads of things to be working on with her. Lots to do. And without a test, we wouldn't actually pick up any of that. We would just be stuck with a client who's got a lot of allergies, got a restrictive diet, and we need some tools to start saying, well, what's going on here? And um, she's actually one of my clients, so I did this and I did a CDSA just so I could look at gut function. I was fairly convinced I'd find a parasite and I didn't, and in fact, I didn't find anything on her CDSA at all, which made me particularly glad I had done this, because even though I've been a practitioner for years, I am very guilty of sitting in clinic going, yeah, I know what's going on, got that one sorted, we'll just do this test and find out. And then when it comes back, as in the case of her CDSA, I was genuinely surprised to see, actually, she'd had about diarrhea, so she had low lactobacillus, um, but that would have been washed out by the, the, the diarrhea. Um, other than that, it was pretty good. And um, yeah. yeah. This was just such a gift because I, I, there's so much to work on here. So that's my case study to close. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Well, we've gone through a few questions already. Um, just a sort of comment really that everybody's taking um, a, a crazy amount of vitamin C and zinc at the moment. Um, you know, just comment, perhaps a comment on that. Uh, okay, yeah. I totally understand why they are doing that. So zinc supplementation alone without manganese um, will lower your manganese status, which starts to affect energy. That's really not gonna be a problem short term. If you're worried about your immune system, then taking zinc makes perfect sense to me, so long as you're taking it with B6. I will come back and say, but actually test yourself and find out if you really need it. The vitamin C is really interesting. We forget a lot about what other nutrients are affected. So I've talked about how high copper can be a problem. When we have high copper, one of the things that we'll often use to lower it is vitamin C. And that works really, really well until we get very, very low copper. So anything under one milligram per cent. 
If we take vitamin C at that point, we will lower the copper even further. The problem then is, copper is at the heart of a lot of the antioxidant enzymes. Think about superoxide dismutase. Copper's at the heart of that. If you don't have sufficient copper, you can't make enough of your antioxidant enzymes, which is going to impact your immune system. Now, short term, your vitamin C is not really an issue, but I think most of us have come across clients who have taken vitamin C for a long period of time and believed it truly stopped them getting colds and bugs and flus and things, but then found one season it didn't work. And very often that will be because the copper had been driven down too low. So, I mean, most nutritional therapists, I mean, I don't know whether you're in that book as well, but I mean, you know, if we have a sniffle or something's coming on, then we hit the vitamin C. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm in that boat as well. Um, we, import what we, do. Um, we import a product here called ZMC, zinc, manganese and vitamin C. I was going C. to mention that because I have said in the chat box that Mineral Check do do their own range of products. And, you know, when you if you do do the test, they'll recommend... Um, I have to say the ZMC is something I'd use an awful lot of because of the way it's made up. It's, it's my it. absolute go-to. Yeah. The minute anybody in my house or even any of my friends sniffle, um, yeah. I'm one of those really great nutritional therapists to have as a friend. Oh, you're sniffling. Have a pot of ZMC. And yeah. I'll just, because I, ha I, I, I own the company, I import it. I'm like, oh, you know, do I turn up at a dinner party with flowers? Maybe, but if you've been sniffling, you're more likely to get a pot of ZMC than that's a bunch of flowers. Um, so it would be my absolute go-to if anyone's sniffling. And yeah, I think at the moment, I would say, of course, take it. But actually, I do know my copper level and I know it's not doing any harm. So that's cool for me. Right. Okay, well, um, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. Uh, Karen, thanks very much. If you could just stop the recording. Um, and great to see a few familiar faces and, and lots of familiar names. We'll send out the...